talk all night. It's so good to see Bill DeSteph. He just walked in. He just came from a meeting. Come up here and talk to us for a minute. Bill DeSteph, part of our state senate. Did I demote you or promote you? I, I got it right. Same position. And this guy has been a blessing to Wave Church for many, many years. You've been very involved. Why don't you say hi for a moment? Thank you. Well, I just want to say good morning. Thank you all for being here. This is a time that we need our church. This is a time our church stands up and carries us. Um, the Lord has carried us for the last 40 hours. Um, that's, that's time for the, uh, that to transition over to our church. Um, our first responders in the building were the first alert system, the employees, telling everybody what was going on and, to get out, and then to get out. And our first responders, our police, who are back here today, our firemen, our EMS. Our sheriff's deputies and our state police were the first ones in the building to respond. I want to tell you, I'm extremely proud of them. They did it with compassion, and they did it with professionalism, but mostly they did it with compassion. And yesterday when I was visiting with the victims, they wanted to ensure that we pass that on, that they were so grateful that they did it with compassion, and they did it with professionalism. And I won't go into details, we're in church, but I will tell you that these are the consummate professionals they had to do a job, they did it well, they carried people out of the building when it was needed. So let's give them another round, thank you. Come on, these men represent our police force. They represent the, the men and women who took down that shooter and saved other people's lives. We, we wanna say thank you for doing what you do every day moments like this, it becomes more real, but I want to say thank you every day for your service. We honor you, and I want to pray for them. Is that okay? Stretch your hand out toward these men. Father, we just thank you for every man and woman that serves and represents uh, our safety. And Lord, I just pray today that they would know that you are with them. Lord, comfort them. They have to deal with this in their own way as well. But Lord, we honor them today. We pray for them, and we thank you for them. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for their families. Thank you for the price they pay. Lord, bless them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Are you ready for, I think, will be a very powerful interview. Are you ready for this? So we've got two special, special people with us tonight that actually are going to be part of this panel. Pastor Brian Houston has pastored Hillsong Church, I think you said for 30-some years, and he's been the senior pastor of that church. And Without a doubt, as a pastor of a large church, you navigate people through some of the hardest times and some of the best times. It's like, you know, from the womb to the tomb as a pastor. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from him. And as well tonight, we have a psychologist, Dr. Danny Holland, who's right here at Wave Church. And he also uh, has had years and years of experience, also was a pastor in a church life in Hawaii. And so I want you to welcome them as they come to the stage tonight. Come on, give Pastor Brian Houston, Dr. Danny Holland. Come on, stand to your feet, give him a big welcome. We're gonna get some wisdom tonight. Here we go. The big eagle. Pastor Brian, please. Yep, absolutely. Amen. You can be seated, everybody. And uh, the first question I want to ask is, uh, Pastor Brian, who was the best pastor that ever served on your team that went out there and did great things for the Lord? Now, you told me the answer to this before the meeting. What was it again? Yeah. It was uh, uh, Sharon Kelly. Sharon yeah. Kelly. You know, that's literally true. That would literally be true. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, Hillsong Church is 30, how many years? 30? It'll be 36 in August. 36, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, I was that, 29 when we started. I, I remember you were actually, I remember get, I got saved and Pastor Brian was just in, a, in the city church and you were 
like opening churches everywhere. And I used to, I know we had church on Friday night. And so Sunday night, we were free. I used to go anywhere, I, anywhere to hear this guy preach. He was like, I just loved what he did and how he did it. And I always thought one day it would be pretty amazing to actually work alongside of him and the opportunity came. So as, as a pastor, what? He was great, by the way. He did a great job. <laughs> eight years. The quickest eight years of your life. You loved it so much. It was. It absolutely was. <laughs> actually, it actually was. I promise you. I had the best yeah. job in the world. I had no reason to go except God. So he, He's, he also preached faith into our people. And uh, I still have, like, George Agadjanian, sorry, yeah. uh, a name you don't know, but Pastor Steve does. He was still to hear me. He says, ah, oh, you know, Steve was such a great faith preacher. Mm. Yeah. I remember working with George <laughs> quite a lot. He was fun. I loved him. All right, love him. Okay, so you've been the pastor for decades, and not just 36 years, but even before that. And uh, you've seen people walk through some real struggles, pain, tragedies. Uh, what have you shared with them? Uh, in those times and those seasons? What have, what have you said to try and help them navigate that? Man, I'm not sure because at that moment, you're not sure whether anything you say is mm -hmm. going to make that much difference. Obviously, you believe for the Holy Spirit to put a word in your spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think we don't do is say just trite things or, uh, you know, uh, things that are uh, cliche or certainly don't tell people to get over it and things like that you know you'll get over it uh, what i think we can do though is be great listeners yeah i think our being there our our felt support mm. uh and that felt sense of community and family is in my mind what po people need the most and it is really good to ask the holy spirit uh in terms of what to say in that moment i think it's true i think the most important part from my perspective is there are things you probably would want to learn of what not to say, like, yeah. you know, especially in light of what's happened, you know, the Lord took them home because I don't believe that is God, mm. not for a second. Uh, but I think sometimes we don't know what to say, but you being there and you just being part and letting them know you're gonna walk through them. And actually for often people, I find the hardest time when everybody just speaking about specifically the loss of a loved one, um, it's in that moment when everybody rallies in the moment where people's someone's taken from us and there's a lot of shock and family gather friends gather it's usually after that that help really is most needed just because once that all the family's gone home and everybody gets back to everyday life then that person is facing the reality of every day that person's no longer a part of their life and i think that's an important time uh -huh. for us to be intentional about stepping into people's lives uh -huh. dr yeah, danny yeah, definitely that is a, that's a critical moment and there just aren't words there aren't words to say it's OBK because what happened wasn't okay. Right. Um, what they've experienced is not an okay situation. And, you know, just to echo what you guys are saying, just to be present and be empathic. You know, touch into the some kind of experience we've had, a loss we've experienced, and just be present with people. Just leaning in and being present can be such a powerful thing. Yeah, well, it seems to be the common thread on that one, doesn't it? Just understand it. There's power in you just being there helping somebody and sometimes you don't have words and it's not the words that matter it's actually your care and your compassion without a doubt I, this one's an important question because I think this is something whatever the loss is whatever the tragedy is whatever the pain is uh, what are some of the trips um, uh, that people um, you know make in in a struggle in a valley in a season, like what, what are some of the things you think people do that aren't healthy, that isn't going to help them? Man, I think um, I think some of the big dangers is just you lose sight of God. You get angry with God. You start blaming God. You can't understand why, and uh, it just seems so unfair. And I think it's tragic when people, in a moment like that, rather than understanding that you can find God in this situation, that He's there for you. I um. <laughs> if you don't mind, but I brought some notes from a message I preached last year. I'm not going to preach the whole message, don't worry. But just a couple of scriptures. This, it was actually called The Power of Loss and uh, how God can use loss in our lives. Uh, but, you know, one scripture with Job. Job, uh, you know, Job, he lost everything. I mean, he lost his wife, his family. Uh, he lost his fortune. He lost his livestock. He lost his reputation, his credibility, and obviously he lost his health. He lost all of that. But there's a scripture in Proverbs, I just want to read it. 
make sure I get it right. I'm going to find it first. It says, Job 1.22, in all this, all that loss, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Wow. And I think that's such a powerful thing is rather than blame God, and mm. run from God, in actual fact, to see at that moment, God can be closer to us than any other time. And we need to throw ourselves on God. Jeremiah, who also wrote Lamentation, you know, he was lamenting over Jerusalem and the loss of the temple and no doubt the loss of, of you know, fellow, fellow Israelites. And he was lamenting. And it's a, it's a book, a loss. Lament means to lose. It's a book of loss. But in the middle of that book, uh, Jeremiah said some things, you know. He said, I will not be consumed. I just want, do you mind if I read just a couple more scriptures? Do. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Brian <laughs> Houston in the house. Oh, really? And so, Lamentations 3, verse 19 to 24. I'm going to just read it from the message. We don't have it, so hopefully you can listen. It said, I'll never forget the trouble, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting the bottom. But there's one other thing I remember, and remembering I keep a grip on hope. God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They're created new every morning. How great your faithfulness. Listen careful. I'm sticking with God. I say it over and over. He's all I've got left. I just think that's powerful. He talks about the, the loss uh, it, also in, the, in Lamentations, and he said, I will not be consumed. And, uh, you know, just to hold on to God like that. I think also we can lose sight of ourselves. Uh, there's nothing like pain and loss to locate who we really are. And, I mean, when the disciples at the cross, uh, Jesus, obviously, what a loss. Uh, they were so close to him, their savior, their mentor, their friend, and they loved him. And, I mean, to be honest, they weren't the most spiritual people there in that loss. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who uh, provided for his body, and Nicodemus, wasn't it? And, uh, and, and the women that were in the narrative, they all were the ones who were more spiritual. But the thing is that the disciples, they were cowardly. They were full of self-pity. They were the opposite. They weren't picked as disciples because they were the most spiritual, but God was there for them. And they located themselves. They really did. But I think anyone here who's faced loss or is facing loss, there's more in you than you think. And you're going to find out there's more in you than you think. So that danger of losing sight of God, losing sight of ourselves, um, losing, losing perspective. It's just so easy to lose perspective. And that's always tragic when we somehow, we, we lose sight of just, you know, how, God, how great God is and yeah. where God is. And I believe God in the middle of it all can give us perspective. perspective. And the other thing is I think we can lose uh, sight of purpose, lose hope for our lives, lose purpose. And that's always a tragedy. Do you remember in Australia when we were much younger, especially you, because you're younger than me, uh, can you remember there was a horrible, a, a horrific murder in the area that you came from, Anita Kobe, Anita Kobe, and like five or six monsters took this girl into a field in Sydney and tortured her and raped her and left her for dead. It was a horrible, horrible uh, story. They were all still will be in jail to their dying day. But here's the thing. I mean, how do you recover from that? Her parents obviously are devastated. But her father's name was Frank Cobby. And he actually started a, a, a not a ministry, a, but a, a, a charity helping people in loss. He found purpose in it. Not only that, he would, when families lost a child in a car accident or whatever, he would actually, he would actually call the families and just minister to them and, and uh, you know, show them some compassion and love. So if we can get through loss and still know who God is, know who we are, have a great sense of perspective about what counts and what doesn't count. One other scripture, sorry, and then I'll leave you guys to talk. One other scripture, though. And you know what it says in, in Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes says, better a house of mourning than basically a party, a, a place of merriment. And I'm thinking, what could be better about a funeral than a, than a celebration? I'm talking about perspective. And you know what? It's a weird thing to say, but 
I often like funerals. I hate that someone died. I hate the grief. I hate the pain. But I love listening to the family. Yes. I love listening to kids uh, talking about their parent, their, their father, their mother. I love listening to the, the parents, uh, sorry, to the families. And to me, it always moves me. And I think if there's anything about loss, we get great perspective. Yeah. We remember the things that hopefully we do remember, how important our family is, how so many hours at work may not be the most important thing, sorry, right. but, but that there's sometimes more important things. I think that a lot of things can trip us up in loss, mm. and yeah. it's just great to decide that's not going to happen to me. See Sorry. what happens when you just, just p ask a question and you just get an opportunity to hear the wisdom that flows out. That was powerful. Let's thank God. That was really awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Denny, what are, what are some of the things that happen, that, the vulnerabilities that happen in people in, in, in times when they're struggling? What are some of the vulnerabilities? You know, it's so easy for people to get caught up in the narrative of the struggle and a lot of what's going on. And it can be such a difficult, demanding time mm. of, of data and information. And um, there's usually a rock to, the, to their vulnerabilities, to their uh, to feeling, feeling like their, their uh, wellness could be challenged and right. really have that sense of uh, lack of security. Mm. And I think when we experience that, even as a community, um, we continually struggle with trying to make sense of it. Um, we want to find a cause, a quick reason. We want to homogenize a very complex issue down to some very simple solutions. And it can be really, really complicated to do that and try to come up with a, a reason or an answer or some kind of a thought on that. And, and you know, that's why I really, I really uh, like to echo what Brian said and um, just really trusting that character of God in those things. Mm. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't, there was no previous example of people being thrown in furnaces. They didn't yeah scripture flip through a little bit and see the verse and go oh yeah we're probably gonna be okay mm. it just wasn't there yeah. you know they trusted two things they trusted that god loved them and cared for them and they trusted the character of god mm. and there's many times where we don't have answers yeah. and we have a lot of fear and we have a lot of anxiety and we have to sit back and trust yeah. that god would be better to us yeah. than we could ever be to ourselves with mm. unlimited resources That's if good. we had every resource in the world to do everything good for us we could not create a better story and narrative of our life than what God allows us to experience and that's draws good. glory from. That's and awesome. I think that's a critical thing to notice. In fact, that's why one of my favorite verses is Isaiah 45, three. And Isaiah 45, three says that there are riches found only in darkness, yes. only in times where we feel distant from God. There are things God produces inside of us mm. that will give eternal benefit to us and those around us that can only be found in times where we question whether God's alive, active, and cares the best for us. Wow. So there is a narrative here. There's a part of this story we don't enjoy, and we have to just look around and say, I'm going to trust the character of God when I don't understand his hand. I don't understand what the world is going through. I don't understand why he allows things. He is still better to us than ever and has been faithful to all generations. Yeah. That's well, awesome. I was... Uh, I was in Dubai in the Middle East in the airport, and there was a woman on an escalator, long, long moving walkway, and it was obvious that she hadn't seen one of those before. She looked panicky and nervous, and long story, she got to the absolute end of the escalator and didn't know what to do, and she was panicking. You could see her panicking. She takes one tiny step off the escalator and just stops. Well, there's hundreds of people coming behind her in a busy international airport, and they had nowhere to go. Oh, and it was a disaster scene. People, bags were flying, people were flying, literally. And uh, it was a crazy scene, but what I got from it is when something's over, don't stop. You know, the end of an era is not the completion of a destiny. And so <laughs> I think that what the devil wants people to do, and obviously grief is real and it takes time and maybe you know, maybe mm. the, the pain will be there for the rest of a person's life when we really lose mm. something. But what the devil wants us to do is stop there. Wow. And just l lose our ability to move on. And uh, so if something's over, don't stop. The end of an era is not the completion of a destiny. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. <laughs> You got all that just from watching that. That's pretty cool. I'd be just going, poor lady, get out of the way. 
some things over don't stop. I actually have a dear friend. His name is Pastor Rob Coke at Rob and Laura, and uh, they lost their son. And I, I was thinking about what you shared about sometimes we don't know the answer. And uh, dear friend, and I rang him up and I said, you know, again, just, you know, how you doing? And, and even the question, how you doing, is probably not the best question. We already know they're not doing well. And, uh, and so I just say, I said, you know, Rob, you know, he's a pastor of a church and he's helped many families deal with the tragedy and loss. But now this is in his family. And he said, Steve... I don't understand how this happened. And I don't know, you know, just where is God in this? He says, but one thing I won't do, I won't exchange what I know about God for what I don't understand about God. And what I know is God is good. And I don't understand this, but I will not exchange. I will not change that. And so I think that was profound too. I think the other thing, I've just in a vulnerability and we're maybe now just just for a moment, transition from the sense of the loss of someone just to people going through a struggle, just going through a tough time. I think one of the most important things you've got to be careful of is when you are going through a challenging season, you lost your job, you got a bad report, um, you know, something's happening in the family, um, challenges with your children, just, just life, you know, just doing life, things go wrong. I noticed that it's something that I actually notice as a pastor, we've got to be so careful that you don't become self-obsessed and suddenly your whole world becomes narrow and everything becomes about you where you actually end up becoming insensitive to what's happening for others around you. One of the best ways to find help and wholeness is when you have a need, find someone else who's got a need and just make sure you don't just live inwardly. Make sure you keep an outward focus because it's so easy to get caught up with self and just make everything about you. And I understand it is hard. I understand it is painful. I understand it is challenging, but you're not going to help yourself and you're not going to help others around you by actually just allowing yourself to get self-obsessed. Would you agree? All right. So maybe just for a moment, you and I have talked a little bit about the five phases of grief. Right. And so uh, I'll let you talk us through them because I think they're, they're pretty powerful. I think yeah. um, just maybe just mention all five first. Well, just the stages of grief are, are, are really kind of flow through a lot of different areas where you could start from just this anger and this disappointment and kind of work through this disbelief. And they're not really linear. They jump all around. Grief is not, a, grief, grief is not an event. Right. Grief is a process. Right. Um, it is a process of, of, of going through, and it's a natural process. You know, we're not designed to say goodbye. Right. You know, I remember uh, driving to work one morning and my uh, firstborn son sitting at the glass door, just waving, sitting there crying. And I mean, I broke my heart, you know? I mean, I just thought, I don't want to go to work today. And I thought, I'm going to be home in seven hours. You know, I get to come right back. But I remember seeing that and thinking, you know, we're just not designed for goodbyes. You know, it hurts. And so there's stages that we go through when we're trying to go through grief. And we can be all over the place on what those look like and jump around. And uh, it's normal to go through waves of anger, to go through some waves of being okay with things and resolve and acceptance. And then moving into some kind of uh, other frustrations or disbelief. Mm. Um, all of those things are normal human experiences to, right. to going through a level of grief. You know, I'm always, uh, always challenged by... Um, people who think, well, there's a lot of ways to get to heaven. And I just recall Jesus praying in the garden saying, Lord, if there's another way, let this cup pass. Right. I mean, Jesus himself questioning, you know, I don't want to go through this. Right. You know, if I don't have to go through this, let him, let there be another way. Right. And there wasn't, but it was really a powerful moment of even, even those times of just letting go and being away from people and just saying goodbye. So any loss we go through, there's a process of grief like that. And, but with that too, I love what you said because I thought that was powerful. It's not as like these aren't chronological. These can coexist. And, and in yeah. a day, you can have anger. You can have denial. In the same sentence. In, in the same sentence. You yeah. can have depression. Mm-hmm. Um, you can have an emotional outburst, mm-hmm. right? And then the final one is when you finally come to a place of acceptance. Yeah. And, and, and I remember just helping people and just talking to people about that and just saying, you know, 
hey, these are, you know, sometimes you, 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 it's not you're going to correct someone. Right. It's just understanding that's how they express grief. And just, just to conceptualize it, it it's, we would liken somebody's been married 30, 40 years and loses a spouse. It is, it is almost exactly like emotionally losing a limb. Yeah. You can continue to function without that limb. Mm. You'll learn how to make accommodations, but you will always know that limb was missing. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't go away. We mm -hmm. can learn to adapt. Life can be different. For these 12 families, life will never be the same. Yeah. Will they be able to move on? They will be able to move on and work through it. Mm. Um, but life is, is permanently different for them. Absolutely. So maybe just while I got just you on that conversation, just how do you, like as a, as a trained psychologist, and I'm aware of this, I know tomorrow, we, you know, our kids will go to school. Wearing they'll, blue, yes. They'll, they'll talk to other kids. Wearing blue, by the way. That's a good point. Yeah, all the students in Virginia Beach have been asked to wear blue. Asked to wear blue tomorrow in mm -hmm. honor and respect for what's happened there. So, but, you know, parent, where's parents? Sometimes we don't know what to say. We kind of feel like right. what's age appropriate. We, we don't want to talk about it, but they're going to hear it, whether it be news, whether it be at school. What would you say to people just talking to their children, what, what, what would you say? Yes, yeah, so this is, a, this is a very powerful moment in, um, and the, these are the cards we've been dealt as parents. We have mm -hmm. to, we, we have something we have to discuss with them. It's really important to understand that the human mind gravitates toward the negative, toward the exception. Mm -hmm. You didn't wake up this morning and go, man, my right arm feels so good. You right. know, we picked that part of the body where it's caught our attention, that hurts. Um, we, it's the ex exception to the norm. And so we as parents tend to, feel that exception, we see something that rocks our stability and our safety and our sense of being okay, and we start exploring the media, and so kids see a lot of these things, mm. and they don't have the way to conceptualize it like we do. So what's really critical for parents is that, first of all, we, we wrap whatever we do in reassurance. That's mm. what's critical, that we reassure kids that everything's okay, that they can be safe, we can take care of them, and what we do is we kind of start off by asking them, uh, what their thoughts are. What do they know about these things? Find out what kind of language they use, what mm -hmm. kind of terminology. If children are under six years old, they're a little more concrete. And I think the mistake many parents make is they give too little detail. Right. In other words, they don't have to go through step-by-step -step detail of everything that's occurred in an event or some kind of issue, and especially like this one. But if you just say some people got hurt at work, um, that that won't make enough sense to somebody that's younger. And six-year-olds, again, everything's black and white, good and bad. It, they're very, very, so, you know, there may be a story of, like, there was a bad man who was very angry and did some terrible things to some people. That would be a way you could generalize. You want to be brief, you want to be specific, but you want to be uh, age-appropriate with them and kind of give them that kind of feedback and wrapping it in that reassurance and reframing it. Because like I said, the negative takes the forefront. So we want to make a focus on the fact that there are millions of people in our community, million people here in Hampton Roads that are good people, that would defend them, mm -hmm. that would keep them safe and kind of highlight and balance out the amount of overwhelming data that's in front of us right now as a community okay. with the supports, the strength, mm -hmm. and the safety that is around for our children. So let them talk. Right. And then just, you know, don't have to be specific, but right. be conversational. Be conversational and continue to let that conversation ride. Right. I would also add that, you know, as parents, we teach kids what we know, but we, we train kids by how we live. Right. It's, it's what we do and yeah. that transfers. And it's such a powerful concept. I mean, God himself, Jesus said, I can't do anything. I can only do what I see the Father doing. Yeah. And then Jesus tells his disciples and says, mm. I no longer call you servants. Mm. I call you friends. And greater things than these you will do. We see a, a transference uh, here. So even if our kids won't want to talk about it and listen to it, how we model emotional regulation, how we model the words coming out of our mouth and our anger and our frustration, okay. um, our kids will pick up on that tempo and they will capture. Yeah. We teach them what we know, they hear it, they learn. They yeah. can capture from us a way of responding to these things by the way we respond. And don't shelter them. Like, you know, and, just and don't, grieving don't you feel like we're protecting them sometimes. Exactly. And we minimize it. And, but they will hear about it. They will yeah. come to wrong conclusions or whatever. So. Yeah, we don't want to minimize. We really, and when we're grieving, we're going through things, it's healthy for kids to see us grieving. Right. Yeah, it is. Uh, Pastor Brian, I, I think, what are some scriptures you share with people uh, that has been, you know, comfort for personal tragedy? Are there, some, are there, are there go to scriptures for you? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think I have automatic go-to scriptures. 
again, I think you just believe the Holy Spirit to put the right thing into your spirit. But, you know, the, David, in all of his persecution and his loss and his opposition, he wrote so many incredible Psalms that, you know, basically were his own cry to God. And I think in the Psalms, there's, you know, there's so much comfort and, and so much, uh, you know, so much wisdom, really. And uh, so, uh, you know, I think the Psalms are fantastic. And mm. yeah, I, uh, I, if I, if I can just read one more little scripture here, uh, if I can find it, I can't find things in my own notes. But if I don't find it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, where was it? Where is it? If I don't find it, it's fine. No, here it is, yeah. No, it's not. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah, so I, I just really believe the Holy Spirit to put scripture, but there's so much hope in the Bible. Yeah. So it's not hard to find scriptures of hope. And I think if we give them compassionately, you know, and we give them at the right time, uh, God obviously is in his word, and, and Jesus is the word. And I think that uh, it's not hard to find scriptures that are going to bring life into a, into a dead situation and bring hope into an impossible situation. Yes. I, would, I would agree. And I think it's really true. I love what you said, though. It's really kind of let the Holy Spirit guide you yeah. because it, I think it's a temptation sometimes for us to be to make statements that you could read on a bumper sticker. Yeah. You know, like um, God is good all the time, you know. And but for them in that moment, right. uh, that can be a really powerful yeah. thorn of I don't believe that anymore. Yeah. I don't think that. So it's really about having those conversations and being comfortable enough to sit in their frustration, yeah. their doubt, their anger directed at God. God's got big shoulders. He can take it. And God, God knew before time that day would come and that challenge would come. And we can just partner with the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what we do mm. to be in that moment with them, to be present mm. and just process through that with them. I think that's the most powerful thing. Has, has in, in your life, have you found that even in some of the, your own personal experiences of pain it, what kind of it gives you a greater perspective on life like it changes your view yeah yeah um well, you know very well that mm. 20 years ago i went through the most painful experience myself and still am living in the fallout of it now so it didn't involve literally like losing yeah. uh, a, a loved one but what it did involve was my father who was my hero in 1999 i was <coughs> excuse me i was 45 and at 45 years of age, I was already established as a pastor. I found out that my father, my hero, uh, was a pedophile, had abused kids. And my own, you know, sense of loss, I was because I was at that time leading a whole denomination of churches and then pastoring a big church and, you know, with my own kids, his grandkids, he was also their hero. Mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to pilot everyone else through this and it's almost the opposite to what you were saying because you know we're saying we don't get so absorbed in ourselves and you're right, right. Uh, you know we've got to remember other people but I think I was the opposite mm. I didn't give myself any attention right. and I made it all about you know going into making it about everyone else and uh, so 1999 by about 2012 so literally 13 years later I have wound down so far emotionally mm that I went into what I didn't think was possible for me, um, as close as a burnout you could get. By God's grace, I came out of it super quick uh, after talking to someone like you. And I, you know, I think God gave me a miracle because I came out of it. But you know, I do know that uh, you know, I felt, what I felt was a sense of loss. Even to this day, I, I don't feel like I could ever honor my father publicly because people know about the evil in his life. Yeah. I didn't personally meet that evil side of him. I only met the father I knew. Mm. But it was very real. And I, I would just say that anyone who's facing pain, you know, of any kind or loss of any kind, uh, don't suppress it. Don't, yeah. uh, don't not deal with it because that's the way that, in the end, it will wear you right down. Uh, so we all have our pain. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the crazy thing is, you know, Steve, is I'm still dealing with the fallout of that. Now, I was only a teenager myself when these things happened. Mm. But, uh, you know, what social media is like and other things are like, so I've still got people attacking me over things that my father did yeah. when I myself was a teenager. Yeah. So I need your help, Doctor. I got you, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
I, I find when I see, I'll never forget, this is going to sound in light of that conversation, I remember when I broke my foot and I have a, had to have a foot reconstruction, um, I found my point of view change toward people. I mean, I, I, this is a terrible confession, but have you ever noticed sometimes, um, you know, like the disabled parking, how many disabled parking spots there are in a mall, and then you kind of where you're parking, and you kind of think it's good that we have that for disabled people because it's close to the building. But every now and again, on my more carnal day, I think, man, there's a lot of those. I've got to park a mile away. But when I broke my foot, I remember just, you know, seeing somebody in a foot cast, and all of a sudden, my whole perspective on life based on the pain that I'd been through, I had so much compassion for people. And I, I remember one time I saw a guy parking. I would never park at a disabled parking person's spot. I saw a guy parking at a disabled person's spot, and I said, hey, get out of there. People actually need those spots. And uh, he goes, well, no one's parking in it. I said, well, they won't be able to now if you're in it. And it just actually, I found, I found, like I saw this person in an airport, and I remember one time with my cast, I was going off to preach in an airport, and I looked, and it was gate 28, and I was at gate two. And I just went, God, I don't know how I'm going to make it to that gate. And I'm, there was no walking walkways, moving walkways, nothing. And I suddenly saw people differently and had a greater level of compassion because of the pain that I went through. So I think that's something that actually helps us too. We actually do become more compassionate toward others. Yeah, I definitely think pain pain will change us and pain will, will that we experience, we begin to see things and frame things a little bit differently. You know, God is just so capable of handling things and sometimes it just refocuses us a little when we can just see our humanity. Yeah. Like the humanity of your father. I mean, we live in a fallen world. Mm. Um, nobody is raised and born in a vacuum. People go through things. There are things that shape people's lives mm. that we can't control, you know, and God is not caught off guard by that. He's not caught off guard by any of those things. And it is just his ability to make things right is infinite. Yeah. You know, we are not capable as human beings enough to mess up our lives beyond where God can repair it. That's good. God is infinitely more able well to bring about his will through your situation and through many others. Yeah. He is more infinitely able to bring about good, to bring about things and accomplish his purpose in us. So many people are fear. What if I miss God? What if I miss God? You know, do what you know to do and continue in the habits you're supposed to go into and walk straight, continue doing what you're doing yeah. and, uh, and trust God. God, y you couldn't miss the mark. God is and his Holy Spirit is so good. good. And uh, they are so interested in you accomplishing the task he has for you and your assignment on earth. You are not capable of messing that up. And the pain we go through and the struggles we go through, they don't make sense. Uh, we, don't, we don't have all that wisdom. Paul says we see through a light dimly. Mm. We don't see everything clearly. Mm. And that's where we have to trust God. You know, and our past experiences, we build on them. I know, Brian, you feel the same thing. You too, Pastor Steve. Where, you know, I think of, of David going to kill Goliath and he brought with him what? The stones, the sling, and his staff. Mm. You know, shepherds would carve in their staffs the events in their life. He carved a lion and a bear. Mm. He brought with him his history of God doing the un impossible with him. Yeah. He said, I'm going to bring the stones to kill the enemy, and I'm going to bring the staff that is my history of God delivering me and doing amazing feats through me into battle. Beautiful. And that's what he chose. Beautiful. Awesome. I, I, was, I read uh, a, a while ago now uh, about leprosy. So the Bible's full of lepers, and no mm. one wanted to go near the lepers. Uh, because they had an atrocious disease where fingers would fall off and limbs would fall off and toes would fall off. Well, now it's called Henson's disease. And apparently about 100 years ago, I think it was in Alabama, here in the States, a doctor uh, worked out that the reason fingers fall off and limbs fall off is they could feel no pain. So you could put your hand on a hot oven and not not feel a thing and so uh, you, 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 could, uh, you could break your leg and if you could stand up not feel a thing so what caused what caused uh, the, the, you know what looked like leprosy was causing was actually was actually they couldn't feel pain and I think the story is this that we uh, you know we all hate pain but it was the pain of the cross that was the power of the resurrection and you know I, I actually think that Pain is our friend mm. because often it alerts us to something bigger. And yeah. I think ultimately God can use pain yeah. in our lives. You just talked about mm. it. We become better people.
Mm. We become better, more compassionate, less idealistic, mm. and I think we start seeing yeah. life in a much, much more um, godly way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to say thank you, Pastor Brian, for being here this whole weekend. You have really honored us. And the thing that I probably admire the most about you, and I know you've been through that. I know that's been tragic. And, but I just want to say thank you for staying the course. I know you'll be feeling like maybe you don't always on your worst night, but I want to say on behalf of Wave Church, on the, and frankly, uh, if I can for a moment just say the church world is so much better because of you and what you've done, and I just honor you for going through it. When you see somebody who's got a big church and you think to yourself, oh, man, they're living the life. All I think about is, and I know, how much pain did they go through to get to where they are? So thank you so much. Dr. Danny, thank you. And I'm going to give it back to...